Welcome back. Um, let me use this picture to label some things. So this is what we are going to do. Uh, we have this model of hydrogen. And this is what we call semi-classical model. It's because you can analyze almost everything about this classically using the physics that you already know. It's semi-classical, not classical, because at some point, we are going to insert our quantum assumption. At some point, we'll do something that makes it non-classical. But so that's the nice part. We can do most of it classically, and then at an appropriate place, we'll put this in later. So um, let me use this to label something. So I have a proton here, which is so massive that we'll assume that it doesn't move as the electron moves around. And so what we are going to have is, let's say electron is at this one of the orbits that's out here. This is my electron, and it's moving in some kind of orbit here. All right. So we want to write down an expression for energy of this electron. So we want the total energy of the electron. Um, so mechanical energy, kinetic, and potential energy, right? All right, so kinetic energy. I'm going to make a bold assumption that this is going to be non-relativistic. <laughs> make things easier for me. So it's kinetic energy will be 1 half mv squared, right? Where do we get potential energy from? Electric yeah, electric potential energy. So this electron is uh, moving in circle moving at speed of v, it's accelerating towards proton because of electric force. So this is where you have to remember, do you remember the expression for electric forces? Or the name where you can get that? Coulomb's yeah, Coulomb's law. And so th that's why physics form is prerequisite for this class, because you're supposed to know it. But you know, if you have to look up, the most important thing to know is the name, so that you can look it up. You look it up in Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law says that force that's uh, pulling this electron towards the proton, this force is given by, um, I guess I will use, do I want to use K? I want to plug in numbers in, so let me do it in SI units and say one over four pi epsilon naught, product of charges, in this case the elementary charge times elementary charge, so E squared divided by the distance squared, so Whatever this distance is, call it r, r squared. Now this gives the force, but because this is a conservative force, there's a potential energy that we can associate with this. Do people remember the expression for that potential energy? If not, I will, uh, let's not go through the derivation. This is something you would look up. You can look it up in your physics 4B textbook. So you know, you look up Coulomb's law, read it down to the part where it talks about electric potential, they do the derivation of electric potential energy, and I guess um, you can look at it two ways. Um, the electric potential due to a point charge that they would derive, electric potential due to a point charge, is equal to um, potential, that would be positive. So the amount of charge divided by four pi epsilon naught, times the distance. Does this look familiar? Yeah. And the potential energy of this electron would be the amount of charge minus E times the potential due to the, the positive charge at the center. Good? OK, let me uh, write all that out. So um, the, this is the expression for the energy. Uh, total energy is equal to 1 half mv squared minus um, the elementary charge of in the electron times the, this q also should be e for the proton. So minus e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. All right. Um, so a lot of the quantities here are constant. This is the mass of the electron. This is the, the, the electric constant. Uh, this is the elect elementary charge. Some things are uh, variables or dynamic quantities. Speed and the orbital radius. 
Um, now, can this speed and the orbital radius take up any value? We are still in uh, classical mechanics. So in classical mechanics, would you say that this total energy is an, essentially an expression that is a function of velocity and V and R? Like, could, could this to be any combination? Like, you could have V equals zero and R equals whatever. Is that right? That doesn't sound right. Imagine this. I have an electron that is in circular orbit around this charge. Could I have V equal to zero? If it's infinitely far away, but it's, a, it's at this fixed distance r, at this fixed distance r, could my V be zero? No, because if V were zero, then it would get sucked in. So there's the exactly correct V it can have. So this expression that we have here, it's not actually a function of two variables. It's a function of only one variable, really. So I'm going to make an executive. Let's see, can I make this choice now? Well, OK, so, it's, uh, um, so we could write this as an energy as a function of V, or energy as a function of R, or energy as a function of whatever. But what we first have to recognize is that this speed and the orbital distance, they are related to each other somehow if you are going to say it's in circular orbit. So let's first figure out the relationship, because that's going to be an important part of how we can derive this expression for energy. So how would you um, express that idea mathematically, that this uh, speed has to be somehow related to the orbital radius? Like what laws of physics that you know would you bring in? Something that you maybe learned in physics 4A. <laughs> what kind of motion is this? Circular motion. circular motion or uniform circular motion. When you have uniform circular motion, what do you have? This is physics 4A, like a second meter material. V over R. So what does the V squared over R give you? Centripetal acceleration. So whenever you have something that's moving in circle, it is accelerating. We call that acceleration. We call that acceleration, centripetal acceleration. And this is what you learned in physics 4A. It's the one formula I have people memorize. This centripetal acceleration is given by V squared over R. And the centripetal acceleration, it comes from centripetal force. But centripetal force is not a new kind of force. It's just a way of saying net force. This is your net force. This provides your centripetal acceleration. So with all of that combined, what you can say is this. You can say, all right, my centripetal acceleration, which from the circular motion kinematics, is V squared over R. That has to be consistent with the Newton's second law. So this should be equal to the force divided by mass. So it should be, in terms of magnitude, E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught, uh, R squared times the mass of the electron. Okay. So this is a single equation that contains V and R and nothing else. So this is the thing that will relate your V to R. So for example, um, so I guess it's, uh, yeah, I keep wanting to, yeah, so let me do it this way. I'm going to solve this for V squared. That's going to let me substitute that in here so that I have energy as a function of orbital distance alone. Okay, so. Uh, oh, so move R over. That cancels one of the R's here. So I get V squared is equal to E squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught R times N. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> now, when I plug this in here, you will see something kind of funny and nice. 
uh, this n cancels out that n. This is the same thing you have here. So it's one half times the same thing as this minus this thing. So when you subtract it, you get a very simple expression, which will be, when you plug this in, what you end up with is minus one half times this e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Like, do people see that? Yeah, this is actually not an accident. There is a, something called the Virial theorem that says something like this always happens, or on average it happens. But, so, but that's a nice result, so I'm going to use that. So, so what that tells me is, all right, the energy as a function of radius can be given as this, minus e squared over 8 pi epsilon naught r. Okay. Now, so far, everything has been classical. I didn't introduce anything new that you didn't already know. And here's the place where I want to ask this question. Can this r be anything? I mean, just classically. Yeah, classically, this R can be anything. And that's what you actually see in the solar system. Planets, asteroids, they can be at any orbital distance from the sun. There's no law of uh, gravity that tells you the planets can only be at these orbital distances. So, so that's where classical physics leaves you. It, and it leaves you with the saying, this electron can be at any arbitrary distance, and it can have any continuous amount of energy. And this is the place where this quantum mechanical assumption enters. So we are going to assume that this is true. We are going to say that, uh, sorry, let me erase and just rewrite a version of it. We are going to say that in this place that allowed a continuously varying energy, we are going to say, well, this is our requirement. Angular momentum must be equal to, must come in units of h bar, or n times h bar. Um, well, I don't have any angular momentum here, so I have to do a little bit of rewriting to see what the consequence of this is on this. Guess the starting place is rewriting what angular momentum is in terms of other mechanical quantities. How is angular momentum defined again? Yeah, that the I omega doesn't sound helpful here, right? What's the other definition, well, like the actual definition of angular momentum? Do people remember? Yeah, so L is R cross P, right? P is MV. So this is technically R cross MV. Well, look at this circular motion here. This is the R vector. This is V vector. Are they perpendicular? So they're a cross product magnitude is just uh, RV. And so direction, you know, here points out here, but like I don't really care about the direction. <laughs> so if you are looking at only the magnitude of this angular momentum, then that magnitude is uh, MVR, MVR. So that's the magnitude of angular momentum. Good. All right. So. Um, so that's uh, what this uh, requirement means. It means this particular combination of quantities, mass times V times R, can only come in this uh, discrete unit. Um, all right. Um, I guess I need to do a little more algebra. So <laughs> it's the same algebra we did before. So before we got rid of uh, uh, V here, so that I have energy only in terms of R. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Let's get rid of V, so that we have some kind of condition on R. Yeah? So I'm still using the same expression here. So what I'm saying is, wait, do I want to? Yeah, I need to get rid of V. So what I'm saying is that, um, sorry, different color. So here, what I'm saying is V is equal to E divided by square root of 4 pi epsilon naught rn. So let's say, plug that in here. 
get rid of V, see what that takes us, where that takes us. So I have, um, let me, yeah, so I have M times R times that quantity E over square root of 4 pi epsilon naught R M is equal to N H bar. Mm. Oh, I um, think I can cancel things out this way. I have MR, square root of MR, so I can say uh, square root of this cancels out that. Okay. Uh, let me solve this for R. So solving it for R gets me this. Um, so I'm going to leave R by itself, move everything else over, and then square them. <laughs> so R is equal to, or well, everything else moved over. So it'll be uh, um, 4 pi epsilon naught n h bar. 4 pi epsilon naught n squared. I'm going to be squaring everything. h bar also squared. Um, let's see, what else did I, I have e and the n to move over. So divided by e squared times m. Did I do everything else correctly? Yes. So this is the quantum mechanical piece that we are inserting into everything that we have been doing so far that has been classical. We are saying, all right, this uh, expression for R, this is my quantized orbital radius. This R is a function of N. Everything else here is a constant, right? So what we are saying is, well, um, only the radius where N is equal to one, two, three, four, those are the only allowed radius for the electron. That's our quantum mechanical assumption. It's a very strange assumption. Once again, there are a lot of physicists around the Bohr's time who thought this was a crazy idea. But well, once you, you're exploring what is the consequence of this crazy idea. And well, so this is one of the consequences. I happen to have energy already expressed in terms of radius r. So let's see what this energy is in terms of all these other things. Um, where do I have space? Uh, I guess I, I can kind of remember this, so let me just erase and rewrite. So energy, according to all of this, is, um, let's see. So I want to plug in this Rn, or rather, 1 over Rn, right? So that's what I'm plugging in. Um, so <laughs> I want to plug in all these constant except for n. So it's uh, um, e squared m divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, skip n for now, h bar squared. So that's, uh, and then I'll, I'll have this n squared, so 1 over n squared. That's 1 over r so far, right? Um, times, and I'm going to write in all the quantities that's coming from all these constants. So I have minus, uh, let me do that in different color so that we can track them correctly. I have minus, that's coming from there. And then I'm having oh, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, okay. So it's going to be this 4 pi epsilon naught squared. Yeah. Um, I have e squared, so this e taken to power of four now, um, and then divided by two. So one half. Yep. So this is what it comes down to. We are saying this energy, which we are now going to say is a quantized energy, energy as a function of n, is this collection of constants times one over n squared. 
So I guess here's another way to put it. We can say that this En is, uh, we can say that it's uh, minus E naught, where E naught is all this collection of constants divided by n squared. And I happen to have the number E naught memorized. When you plug in all these constants, uh, I will write it down and then since let's just show you the null from alpha. This E naught, it turns out to be a pretty simple, easy to memorize number. So it does come in units of energy. And this E naught is 13.6 electron volts. As long as you memorize it in electron volts, it's such a nice round number. Let's uh, just confirm that I remembered it correctly. Uh, that's not all from alpha. All right, I had to plug in all those right. So I'm skipping minus for now. Uh, uh, elementary charge squared, I'm uh, sorry, to the fourth power times. That M is electron mass. Electron mass divided by two times, two times, four times pi times electric constant squ uh, squared times. And that H bar is called the reduced Planck constant. Reduced Planck constant squared. I, yeah, yeah, I can actually simplify that a little bit, but I chose not to. Uh, is that everything? I guess that is. Uh, let's type enter and just confirm when the screen comes up that it's the correct full expression. So let's e, e to the fourth power times me divided by 2, 4 pi epsilon naught squared, h bar squared. All right. Ah, there it is. In electron volt, it's a 13.6. Nice. Uh, I guess it's not exactly round. Nice round number to memorize. <laughs> so, um, so this is, uh, yeah. So, but this is really the key feature that we are looking for. That's the ex that is verified by experiment. This energy levels. So, you know, going back to this, the energy levels. So these are the allowed orbits. So this would be, you know, one, two, three, fourth orbit. This is at, so the energy that it has at the fourth orbit and the, um, the light that's coming from this hydrogen atom, uh, you would say is, the, um, is coming from when this electron is falling from here to some other level. So it's, if it's going from the fourth orbit to the second orbit, you would say, that the, the energy of the photon, or H times frequency, is coming from this difference in energy, E4 minus E2. And when you work out the numbers for this, you should get that cyan wavelength. So this is the picture you have seen, right? The, um, this is the spectrum of a hydrogen atom you have seen. And people have studied this for a long time. And people have studied this uh, spacing of wavelengths for a long time. And there was an even experimental law that said that when you calculate the frequencies, or I guess you can put it this way, the, that this uh, 1 over wavelength was always, um, you could uh, kind of uh, write it out this way. That's equal to? something called Rydberg constant times the difference in the reciprocal of two integers. One over n minus one over n, or the other way around, I forget. This is some law that a guy named uh, Rydberg figured out. It's you know, without any underlying theory or kind of <laughs> theoretical derivation, they figured it out from experiment, sort of like a Planck law. And what we now have is a ex theoretical explanation for this. Sorry, oh, forgot, squared. <laughs> what we now have is a theoretical explanation for this. This is true because the electron energies in hydrogen goes as 1 over n squared, where this is an integer. So um, you know, if you ask the Bohr, and, you know, if you meet him and you, that's the thing you ask, why did you assume this? He would say, well, 
because I get this, and this is experimentally verified. It's not a very convincing reason, maybe, uh, but it is a reason. And this is a beginning place of quantum mechanics 